So we left in the middle of our description of the acute effects of heat stress. And these are, I think a better way to describe these might be physiological effects of heat stress, although that's not quite right either because we're going to get into some other broader effects of heat stress during exercise. These deal specifically with cardiovascular and metabolic changes. That might be a better way to describe this series of 10 points, cardiovascular and metabolic changes. But these are what occur during exercise in the heat with prolonged exposure. And we left off talking about how uh, there's an increase in the lactate produced at the muscle, which might simply be due to a speeding up of metabolism. There's more of a rush of substrates through metabolic pathways, and that might result in more lactate being produced. It might have the consequence of using more carbohydrate. It would also um, involve more anaerobic glycolysis, more ATP production from substrate level phosphorylation. All of those things could be explained by simply speeding up flux through the metabolic pathways in the muscle. By doing that, we're more likely to fatigue those sensitive fibers in the muscle. And by sensitive fibers, um, I mean slow twitch, small muscle fibers that usually carry a lot of carbohydrate, a lot of glycogen, but don't generate very much force. And so if for some reason they fatigue early or can't generate force, they can't sustain workload, we end up relying on fast twitch, larger muscle fibers a little bit more. Fast twitch muscle fibers are the type 2 muscle fibers. We think of them as white muscle. They produce a lot of force. They contract really quickly, but they fatigue very easily. They're very fatigue sensitive, I guess, is a good way to put it. And this agrees with our understanding of the changes in the heat so far, because these types of muscle fibers would also involve a large degree of anaerobic glycolysis. They'd also produce a lot of lactate. They'd also use a lot of carbohydrate. So this agrees with our current understanding of what happens to the muscle in the heat. This also results then <clears throat> in a decrease in exercise efficiency. And this is not a, an appreciable decrease. We're always 20 to 30 percent efficient and a reduced efficiency might be a 2% decrease. It's not going to go down to 5% efficient. But that's still important when you consider that task performance or sport performance is paramount. And in the heat, if you're trying to compete and achieve a personal best, any reduction in efficiency is unwelcome. So a small percentage point reduction in efficiency because of the greater involvement, likely, of these fibers, because of uh, a decreased reliance on oxidative metabolism, which is more efficient overall. What else does this switch do? What else does this switch do? I've broken this point out specifically to um, be separate from the point on lactate, number four. An increase in acidosis is often confused with an increase in lactate. Those aren't the same thing, and that's sort of a, a personal um, point that I like to bring up, maybe a, a small pet peeve. Lactate is an indicator. It often accumulates when the muscle becomes acidic, but it's not the cause of that acidity. The cause of the acidity is increased flux in metabolism, and then more contraction, the, the breaking down, the um, hydrolysis of ATP. So more contractions, less efficient contractions, means more acidosis, lactates produced as a result. Now that acidosis in and of itself is bad, 
the muscle doesn't like to be acidic. If it gets too acidic, some of the proteins can unravel or be damaged. So that's bad. This has a secondary effect of decreasing our reliance on fat oxidation or free fatty acid oxidation. So the muscle is sensitive to acidity. And all the enzymes involved in breaking down fats for energy are also hypersensitive to an increase in acidity or a decrease in pH. Same thing. So as soon as the muscle is significantly stressed and becomes acidic, we switch away from fat oxidation towards carbohydrate oxidation. All of these things describe the same phenomenon. They're different slices of the same pie, if you will. So we have a decreased reliance on free fatty acid, which emphasizes carbohydrate oxidation and helps to accelerate the other points we've talked about so far. Now, that's bad for endurance-type exercise because we get a lot of energy from fat. Tons of energy. But if we're not using it, our energy requirement hasn't changed. We need to get it from a lower, uh, a source that is less energy dense, put it that way. Carbohydrate is less energy dense. You might have, um, or you might know from, have you taken nutrition? Or basic sport nutrition? Four kcals per gram in carbohydrate, four kcals per gram in protein seven or nine kcals per gram in fat, depending on whether you include the glycerol, that's energy density, right? So lots of energy packed in a gram of fat, half the energy packed in a gram of carbohydrate. So we end up using a lot of the carbohydrate stored in the muscle, and if that runs low, we need to get it from somewhere else. The only other source is the blood. And blood glucose needs to uh, supply the muscle for exercise, the brain to keep you conscious, and any other important organs, like the heart, to maintain posture and keep you upright. So if we run out in the muscle, we start to pull glucose from the blood, and the only way to maintain blood glucose is to release more from the liver. But this even has a finite supply. And blood glucose is one of the most tightly defended variables in the body. We keep it at 5 to 6 millimolar. If it's too high, like in the case of diabetics, that's one problem. But if it gets too low, thinking starts to get fuzzy. It's hard to make out shapes and colors. And you faint. You pass out. A very tightly defended variable. So an increased reliance on blood glucose is not good long term. To emphasize the shift away from fat, not only does the muscle start to use less, but it's provided less. Muscle has a little bit of fat on board that it can use for energy, but it gets a lot of it from triglyceride stores in adipose. And for better or for worse, we have a lot of adipose stored around the body, which in geological time frames in, in tens of thousands of years ago was really good because we didn't have to worry so much about famine. We always had a large supply of energy on hand if we were able to stock up and create a lot of adipose. Now it's more of a concern because we have too easy, uh, our access is too, uh, too easy to food. And so that large store of adipose, not great. We'd like to use it in this situation, but heat, the acidity, it doesn't, it actually, I don't know. It might change the metabolism in adipose itself, but it doesn't supply blood. It diverts blood away from adipose tissue. There's no opportunity to put new triglycerides into the blood. Concentration goes down because the muscle needs a lot of blood flow, 
The skin needs a lot of blood flow. Adipose doesn't need a lot of blood flow in this situation. So there isn't very much new fat put into the blood to be delivered to muscle. And lastly, I suppose the black sheep of this list doesn't have to do so much with carbohydrate and fat or metabolism or even the cardiovascular system, but an increase of uh, body temperature, core temperature, stimulates ventilation. And this has secondary effects in, in saturating the blood with oxygen that we're not going to talk about, but it can induce alkalosis. On your slides, this says acidosis. That's wrong. Hyperventilation, blowing off excess CO2, reduces the acidity in the blood, which might help to counteract some of the items that we've talked about already. But a really fast ventilation, not unlike a really fast heart rate, is one of those warning signals to the brain that whatever you're doing is not going to be tenable long term. It's one of those warning signals that might induce fatigue. So a really quick frequency of breathing, FB, stimulating ventilation, hyperventilating, can induce alkalosis, which has its own effects, but this is a warning sign that you uh, aren't going to last long doing whatever you're doing, exercising in the heat in this case. So, this is a long list, and I call these acute effects of heat stress. These are the metabolic and cardiovascular changes that would happen on uh, a short term with exercise in the heat. And by short term, I mean maybe an hour or two hours. And you can see something like this summarized in, uh, in a figure here. Um, meant to specifically observe and record the changes on the cardiovascular mm -hmm. side in response to exercise in the heat. A lot of these we've seen already and they should make sense. We see a progressive decline in stroke volume. Heart rate tries to increase to compensate. Cardiac output eventually is compromised. And we even start to see um, differences at specific tissues. So they went into in depth and looked at leg blood flow and the extraction of oxygen at the leg, um, this, this scattering of, uh, of variables all eventually culminates in fatigue at two hours of exercise in the heat, 38 degrees Celsius in this case. This is useful for understanding heat stress and fatigue, but it's also going to parallel our discussion on dehydration when we get there. And we're not so far behind as I thought. Um, next week was devoted to sports drinks. We can do dehydration and sports drinks within the span of two, uh, two lectures, plus finish up whatever we have here. But we'll see a lot of the same changes. Stroke volume is compromised. Blood volume is lower. Heart rate goes up. So a lot of these are the uh, usual suspects in dehydration as well as in heat stress. So I like the metabolism aspect, I like the cardiovascular aspect, there's a lot of really other cool things that happen in the heat. Neuromuscular impairment. This is not so much functioning of the muscle itself, this is our ability to turn the muscle on. we have a reduced ability to turn the muscle on in the heat. Assuming that the heat makes your body temperature go up, this graph is showing you a progressive increase in core temperature followed by progressive cooling. So this is a linear time frame where the person is heated passively to 39 and a half degrees and then cooled down to 38 degrees. This is all done in one linear session, being heated and then being cooled. And you'll see a decrease in what is called maximum voluntary contraction. 
the percent of MVC at rest. This is essentially a one RM, a one repetition max. If you went to the gym and did a leg press, the most weight you could ever lift. If you did that again in the heat, you'd only be able to voluntarily do 90% of what you did at rest. And then as you cool the body again, we see a little bit of recovery of that performance. So there's a compromised ability to turn the muscle on when your body's hot, and we recover some of that as we cool back down. Notice it's not completely restored to normal, but core temperature is also not completely restored to normal. So that might explain the discrepancy a little bit. So body temperature is reduced, or sorry, muscular recruitment is reduced with a high body temperature. And this seems to be driven by core temperature specifically because the closed circles, the trace on the bottom here, indicates when the skin was rapidly cooled back down to normal. And in comparison to the open circles, where skin temperature was still hot, there's no difference between those two lines. It doesn't matter if the skin was cooled or if the skin was hot, as long as core temperature was at 39 and a half degrees, we saw this impairment in maximum voluntary contraction. So this was a study that um, it didn't use a heated mattress. It used the water perfused suit that I mentioned before. So they're wearing uh, a suit, like a spandex kind of uh, scuba dive dry, uh, dry suit, something like that, that's perfused with these tubes that you can run cold water through. And so as you passively heat the individual at each stage, they'd flush the suit with cold water and get the skin temperature back down to normal to see if the influence of the skin temperature would recover this ability. And it didn't. Core temperature here is paramount. There's no difference between those two lines. So the only recovery occurred when we could cool the core at the right hand, the far right hand side of this graph, as core returned back down towards normal values, did we see an upswing in this graph. So this is uh, maximum voluntary contraction, or percent of MVC at rest. We're assuming in this top graph that even performing the maneuver at rest, you're doing it to the best of your ability. You're doing it maximally. And that's not exactly the case. Another way to look at this is the percent of voluntary activation. This tries to put a number to how much you're turning the muscle on. How much you're turning the muscle on. Even at rest, when you, when you contract maximally, are you turning the muscle on completely? The answer is no. And the way that we know this is to have a person perform their 1RM and then using electrodes, if we're using leg press as an example, using electrodes placed over the quadriceps to stimulate them artificially, to shock those muscles. It's essentially what you do when you activate the muscles. Your brain sends a signal, the action potential depolarizes, turns the muscle on, right? If that signal's not big enough, the muscle's not turned on completely. So what we're doing here is we're artificially overloading. We're, we're providing a signal that is too big to be missed. And by doing that, we can register how much more force could be generated if we can send an appropriate signal from the brain in the first place. So at rest, our maximum voluntary contraction is only about 95, 96% of what the muscle could do. We're missing out on 4% just naturally. And voluntary activation shows, shows the same kind of response. We turn the muscle on less when our body temperature is hot, 
And then we're able to restore that ability a little bit as we cool the body again. Now it's tempting to say that there is a difference between these two lines. There is a little bit of space. It might be two or three percent. But because of the, the spread of these error bars, it never comes out as being statistically different. So we don't have to worry about explaining why when we cool the skin, it seems like the voluntary activation tends to go down. Maybe it's a, an effect of cooling the skin and cooling the muscle, I'm not sure, but this is not significant, so we're going to ignore that there's a bit of spread between those. Same kind of pattern, our ability to turn the muscle on goes down as well, and is recovered as body temperature cools. So this presents an interesting problem. If we're left to, to turn the muscle on voluntarily, we only turn on 93% of our abilities in the heat. But since we're able to stimulate the muscle with electrodes, since we're able to measure this discrepancy, it means the muscle works it could be turned on 100%. The stimulator that we're using does that. So the muscle works in the heat. We're just not turning it on enough. Why? Maybe the signal originating from the brain is not strong enough. And so one way that we can test that is to use a maneuver called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And you might have heard about this. This is a, a biomechanics and a, um, peripheral nerve proprioceptive type of technique. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. Using these two magnetic coils on a little wand that you pass around the outside of your head, you can provide a shock, a not a shock, I won't say shock because it's not electric, but you can provide a focused stimulus to activate different regions of the brain. It's a little wand, something like this. You put over a certain region of the brain, you hit a trigger, and then poof, and you turn on that region of the brain. And I had this done in grad school. It doesn't hurt, but your limb kind of jumps. Or if you can do a low-grade stimulation, you can make a person lean one way or the other, depending on where you're focusing within the brain. So using this type of technique, we can activate the region that's responsible for turning on the muscles of interest, let's say the quadriceps in this case. And if we do that, we don't see any change in this response. So the signal that's originating from the brain is no change in response. Okay. Yes, there's no change in response. So we can't make the brain send out a larger signal than it's already sending out, is what I'm trying to get across. Which means... If the brain is giving the largest signal possible, yet we're still not turning the muscle on enough, the discrepancy, the deficit, has to be somewhere between the brain and the muscle proper. It's either in the transmission through the nerves or at the neuromuscular junction. So there's something about the nerve conduction velocity in the heat or something about the signal getting from the nerve to the muscle in the heat, which creates this deficit in function. So we thought we were out of the woods. We, we rely on carbohydrate, our exercise is less efficient, stroke volume's lower, well that's easy. Let's take a, a sports drink that has a lot of sugar, some fluid, some salt to help retain blood volume. That should correct everything. 
I don't know what kind of sports drink is going to make nerve transmission faster. This is um, something that's going to require a fair bit more research. So there is neuromuscular impairment. Not only, does that make sense? Let me just stop before we move on. Does percent of maximal voluntary contraction make sense? The force that you're generating is less than you would at rest in the heat? Okay. And then voluntary activation, you're turning the muscle on less than you would or less than it's capable of being turned on? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so something's wrong with the signal transduction between the brain and the muscle. And not only that, we observe changes in brain wave frequency or the, the patterns of brain waves, which mimic those that we observe during sleep or rest. Just passive, um, sorry, not passive, Exercise in the heat versus exercise in a neutral environment. And if we can measure beta wave appearance, it changes to a similar pattern that we observe during sleep. Now, it's not to say that this is the reason we start to fatigue or the performance goes down, but it's hard to imagine a situation where a beta wave pattern similar to that which you see during sleep is beneficial for exercise performance. I'll admit this isn't my area, and maybe you have a bit more experience with it. Maybe you're going to talk to Dr. Lamb about it later because this is more her speed. But I can't imagine a situation where that is beneficial for exercise or for performance. From the exercise physiologist point of view, it doesn't matter so much whether brain waves change. What we want to know is, does the whole brain function change? And I'm saying that loose, I don't even know if that's a term, but I'm saying that sort of like whole body function. What's the ultimate consequence of changing those beta waves? RPE is one of our tools as an exercise physiologist that we'll use, the rating of perceived exertion. Whatever the beta waves are, whatever the signal transduction is, this seems to be a really good measure that approximates how hard the exercise feels. And you perceive the exercise in the brain. So whatever's going on in the brain to cause this, RPE is always higher. The exercise always feels harder in the heat. And we can see some EEG activity in the frontal cortex, which tends to parallel that increase in RPE. So if you were so inclined, you could start to decipher what signals might uh, make RPE go up. We don't care so much about that as much as that it goes up. On the metabolic side, a lot like some tissues in the body, the brain suffers a decrease in blood flow, which should be a really big red flag. The brain is probably the tissue of tissues where a decrease in blood flow is really bad. You never want a decrease in blood flow to the brain. Too large of a decrease in blood flow, and there are fail-safes in place to make you horizontal to restore that blood flow. That's the whole process of fainting. It removes gravity from the equation. Blood can easily get back to the brain because it is so vitally important to maintain blood flow to the brain. Now this is probably not a large decrease in blood flow because you can remain upright during exercise, but we see decreases in blood flow that are proportional to our degree of fitness, and that's aerobic, cardiorespiratory fitness, um, and also thermoregulatory fitness. We'll see as we um, go through this discussion that we learn the ability to thermoregulate. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we can connect this change in blood flow to some of the other metabolic markers that we looked at, that hyperventilation that we talked about removes CO2 from the arterial blood, 
the partial pressure of arterial CO2 will go down when you hyperventilate. And this is a change that modifies blood flow in the brain. So in some way, shape, or form, it's likely these two are reduced or, or, or related. But I think it's important to also point out Blood flow is important because it supports metabolism. If you think about a muscle, you send blood to that muscle so that oxygen and nutrients like carbohydrate are delivered. But blood flow does not mean that the muscle is more or less active. It's the supply of nutrients. So blood flow to the brain doesn't necessarily mean that tissue works better or not as well. It's probably pretty closely related, but it doesn't, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It might simply mean in those areas where there's less blood flow, the brain starts to extract more oxygen or extract more glucose. And if it needs to do that, maybe it's more stressed. Maybe that stress is why we see an increase in RPE. Maybe that stress is why we see a change in those beta waves. Maybe stress specifically in the cardiovascular center or the thermoregulatory center changes how we regulate core temperature or how we sweat. It's kind of the black box of our topic so far. Really, the, the brain is sort of the black box of biology of human physiology as a whole. If we can decode and understand the brain, that's one of the major questions of, uh, of biology. It's akin to, are we alone in the universe for an astrophysicist? So definite changes in brain function, in um, the patterns of, of, uh, of blood flow, that may or may not impact our ability to perform. It's likely that all of these changes would somehow contribute to fatigue. I think that's plain to see. What else goes on? What else is influenced by the heat? <clears throat> Conveniently, while the heat is a fairly significant stress and persistent heat, is dangerous for normal cell function. We have this system in place in the body that helps protect cells and proteins and maintain normal function. These are heat shock proteins, so named because we've only observed these, or, or the first time we observed these, was in response to passive heat stress. You heated some, I think it was rats, rats or mice, you heated rats or mice up, and you look to see what changes were made at the, uh, the gene level, the protein level, and we saw these proteins that were only induced in response to the heat. And there are a whole family of these proteins. The numbers here simply mean how long the proteins are. It doesn't mean anything else. But these two proteins seem to be especially important. And their role is to bind or provide scaffolding for the proteins in the cell to work normally. They stop them from unraveling. It's like putting a belt on to keep your pants up. Heat shock proteins keep the components of the cell together and working normally. So we see this induced by heat stress, induced by exercise in the heat. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're starting to realize now as we explore other areas, these are really stress proteins. They're turned on not only in the heat, but if you do really intense exercise, if there's um, a hypoxic situation, if you're at altitude in response to infection, these proteins are mobilized to help keep the cell working properly. And so our understanding is still tenuous. We're learning about these. But we always thought it was a Band-Aid fix. 
that they only turn on in response to heat stress. And it's um, not a preemptive or not a, not, a, not a possible therapeutic avenue. But we can induce heat shock proteins and they help prevent phenomena like muscle atrophy. So now we're using this type of, um, of science, this type of response that we've observed to help um, potentially the elderly. As they get older, they lose muscle mass, they lose muscle strength, the cells stop working normally. This might be a potential avenue to help restore normal function. It's still in its infancy, but um, we've seen this happen in mice. We can heat mice up to induce heat shock proteins, and it stops their muscles from atrophying. In a specific model where muscles degrade over time or the, um, the degradation is accelerated, by heating them up, we slow how quickly their muscles will deteriorate, which I think is a pretty cool phenomenon. Now these probably come into play <clears throat> in response to the infection or um, the endotoxemia that we observe in the heat. And I think we mentioned this already, that under severe heat stress, the intestines become leaky. And they become leaky because of the heat. Not only that, but blood flow is redistributed away from the intestines, so they can't cool themselves as well. It's almost like they're insulated inside the core. And when that happens, gaps open up that allow some bacteria to leak from the intestines into the bloodstream. And we talked about, about already how that changes the, uh, the set point for regulating core temperature. It also stimulates an immune response similar to binge drinking. So your body tries to fight it as an infection, which has other ramifications for performance. We're starting to learn that this might actually affect metabolism. The bacteria circulating in the bloodstream might impact metabolism at the muscle specifically generating reactive oxygen species which might accelerate fatigue, which might be involved in this whole notion of uh, decreased performance in the heat. And we can prevent this. We can prevent endotoxin from leaking out of the intestines by coating them. So we've tried using bovine serum colostrum, which is a protein that's produced in late pregnancy. It's a very thick, milky protein that helps to coat the intestines. And it seals the gaps between the cells. It prevents that bacteria from leaking out. And we can observe a decrease in the, uh, the set point. We can observe a decrease in the inflammatory response. But I don't think drinking a heavy, milky beverage while exercising in the heat is terribly appealing to avoid these side effects. Staying cool might be a better, more preferable alternative. So all told, there are a lot of things that go wrong. The brain starts to function less well. The gut starts to leak bacteria. The muscle um, can't be turned on as well. Force is weaker. Metabolism switches away from fat towards carbohydrate, becomes less efficient. Stroke volume is compromised. Heart rate accelerates. The body just gets hotter and hotter until fatigue occurs. So this can be catastrophic especially in high heat situations or really elite competitions. And I don't say this lightly, this catastrophic means you can suffer irreparable damage if you don't listen to the signals or if they don't cause you to fatigue and you push through them. And so what we would love to happen 
what happens for the 95% of us that are recreational athletes in this situation is we anticipate the catastrophe. We know something's going wrong and we don't push ourselves too hard. Performance unravels, but we stop ourselves before it gets too far. So this idea of anticipating is what we're going to get into next. However, let's take a quick break, digest all this doom and gloom before we come back. Let's, let's do three, four minutes again, and we'll, uh, we'll come back and pick up where we left off with pace selection in the heat.